Hi, how are you? Okay, how are you? Good. Wait for everyone else to get here. So I have a couple of papers accepted today at ICD. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, so... Yeah. <laughs> it's like the first time uh, I, I had an acceptance and we need to ready for one star. It's such a relief. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is that something you can tell the group about, or is that like, I mean, you can tell them when they get here, but. I'm not sure. I can show it to you if you think it's. Like, uh, well, I mean, you know, um, yeah, you, know, so you, you can just maybe tell them about it. I mean, you know, that you got accepted. Maybe when when it's uh, closer to like camera ready or whatever, you can uh, share it. Yeah, the camera ready is like uh, in a week. Okay. So last summer I worked on this uh, data set of cooking recipes and uh, we wanted to do some multimodal analysis on this data, you know, image and instruction and things like that, like what analysis we could do. So in the end we ended up on two or three different side projects. First one was the mapping to nutritional information. Like there have been a ton of different approaches which have been done over the years, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, like most of them were not tested on uh, data which had like a wide variety of uh, recipes, like you know, from different cuisines. So we have uh, about 47 different cuisines, uh, and we have around 160,000 recipes, uh, 160,000 recipes. So uh, we tried out all the methods which have previously been shown to be state of the art, but we thought we could do much better. So we designed like our own approach, and uh, it is definitely like uh, adapted from the previous ones. But we like had a couple of different, you know, a uh, couple of different uh, algorithms around. So we made a bunch of heuristics within the algorithms. And uh, had some time comparing it with the SOTA results. So it took a few months. Yeah. <coughs> and we couldn't put all of it in one bit by it took six pages. So we had to break it into two. Oh, the first part is how do we like uh, get. <laughs> the first part was like how do we get sufficient information out of the recipe to, to have just enough information but not more not less than the information we require to completely uh, go about the same method. And uh, we were sure that what information is required and we did some tinkering around with the uh, types, some data learning algorithms and applied it to cooking recipe because the first time someone has done it. Even though the information around for 10 years. Yeah, that's cool. We thought that could make it to another web and it takes two papers which are quite widely related and go to the ICD. So those are data mining and uh, uh, some NLP kind of stuff. Yeah, that looks really so good. It won't be like very useful to the book because it has been a good and a big one. Yeah, well, it's always interesting to see the. So I'm not sure if it would be watched. Yeah, it's probably closer to like bioinformatics, what uh, I do sometimes and what uh, Stefan does. But I mean, it's really, it looks good. Congratulations on that. So, uh, everyone else, welcome to the meeting. Uh, Ankit and Z and Jesse. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Devanch was just showing his, uh, he got some papers accepted. And um, mm -hmm. he was showing a little bit about that. The it was about uh, 
encoding recipes as algorithms and, and uh, conducting an analysis on them and uh, it's machine learning type stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's a, so if you're interested, you can ask them about it more. But um, it looks pretty good. Yeah, congratulations once again. So uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, a couple things. First of all, does anyone have anything they want to share? Any news? Uh, I had my exams this week, so I didn't do actually anything. Uh, I just saw your comment and commented back. So when we discussed the paper, uh, I, I have something to say. Yeah. OK, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Uh, Jesse is going to be presenting. Uh, we're going to do a session later today. On, he's got something to present to the other group, and he wants to record it. Uh, we'll do that later in the day. There's Stefan. And uh, Z, are you? Uh, how are you doing in your semester? Are you uh, working on projects and? Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. All right, Z. Yep, he says he's doing well. And uh, Stefan is here. Any news from you, Stefan? Um, so, first thing, uh, actually, there were a couple papers I wanted to go over again, like I did last time, uh, just briefly, and I have them in a folder here. Let me see if I can grab a folder link. You should share on, I'll share them in the chat. So, this is, uh, again, a couple, several papers that I've found over the week or last, last two weeks that might be interesting. So let me share my screen. All right. And you can see my screen. All right. So the first paper is this paper. It's a medium post on the cycle of encoding and decoding. What does that mean? Sounds machine learning uh, like, but it's really not. It's actually about uh, visualizations and data visualization. So mm -hmm. this is a paper on like doing data visualization in a way that's very systematic, and they propose this uh, method for doing the you know doing it in a process that makes sense. So they use two groups: encoders and decoders. Uh, so this this graphic, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on it. I can, but um, well, anyways, you can just go through. So number one is identify measurable objects. Number two is define data structure and collect data uh, and apply statistics. Three is generate visualizations and data products. And so you can see they're going from this system, which is pretty nebulous, like it has a lot of moving parts. You find objects, you kind of boil it down. You find the data of those objects. So, you know, something that, you know, is an object has some pattern of data you can collect. And then you put it into something like a graph. So this is kind of like what we do in machine learning in terms of feature extraction. Um, but then there's this other part called decoders, this other stream. And uh, let's see. Uh, so then going from the visualization back to the data, it says crack translation key, which I guess is like, how do you translate this into the back into the data? Identify objects and properties. So it's basically finding metadata from the visualization and applying it back to the data. Then you interpret the data and find meaning in the, in the object. So each data point or uh, piece of data and metadata will say something more about the objects. And then the last step is to update mental map and story. So this goes back to this idea of uh, you know how we think about systems. So this is like uh, what we what Jesse's interest. One of Jesse's interests is uh, 
you know, how do you represent systems? Uh, how do you, you know, represent them in your mind? Um, and so then you have, so you go from like this nebulous system down to a visualization and then back up to better ideas of this, how the system works, better mental models. So this, this article proposes these uh, double encodings of a complex system. So it kind of goes through, it, it's in the area of like data design and data visualization. So you might not be interested in that field in and of itself, but it's actually pretty interesting in terms of, especially like if you're interested in machine learning, to think about your data not only in that one stream where you're taking a system and decomposing it into like a graph or an analysis, but also going the other way and saying, what can we learn about our system? And so she walks through the steps in this uh, blog post. And the tr this is a PDF, so this image got blurred. But well, I guess their, their point here is that you would decode this image, which is a blur, through you know some method. And what, what's the method you use? If you see a bunch of points and clouds, it's easy to interpret that. But if you don't see a clear signal, what does that mean? And so it goes through and... You can read it for yourself. Um, let's see, are there any juicy quotes in here? Well, I mean, it just tells you about like what you can do with a better understanding of your system. So uh, that's that's that article. Then the next one is uh, this is actually something I think from one of the machine learning conferences. Yeah, from ICLR in 2018. It's a paper I ran across. Someone was talking about. Um, actually, there was a conversation on, like, sort of different approaches to, like, uh, kind of uh, connectionism or neural nets. And um, one of the things that I've been talking to someone else about uh, is a nerve net. And uh, a nerve net is something that you find in uh, different. Um, like invertebrate organisms. So jellyfish is one example. Hydra are another example, if you know what a hydra is. Uh, it's basically where instead of having a central nervous system, they have a nerve net. And the nerve net is a bunch of neurons that are connected with, uh, you know, synapses and axons. But they're all over the body instead of being in one central location. And so especially in jellyfish, the nervous system is, is very spatialized. So if you touch the jellyfish on one side, it can conduct a signal to the other side of the organism. And it's, you know, we have a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. So our nervous system innervates our entire body, but there's a centralized component to that. Everything goes to the brain, more or less. There's some local processing in the, in the spinal cord and locally maybe in the hands and feet, but most of our processing happens in the brain, in the central nervous system. In nerve nets, they don't necessarily do that. They process all over the place. It's highly distributed. And so this is actually an attempt to get at this uh, kind of model. And so uh, they talk about nerve nets here. Uh, nerve net first propagates information over the structure of the agent and then predicts actions for different parts of the agent. So they take that very approach in this one. And then they demonstrate that policies learned by NerveNet are significantly more transferable and generalizable than policies learned by other models and are able to transfer even in a zero-shot learning setting. So we haven't talked about zero-shot learning, but this is something in reinforcement learning where you want to teach the agent something all in one trial or in one shot. That makes sense if you don't have a lot of data. And it kind of mimics what we know as fear learning, which is where, you know, if you are afraid of something like if you um, if you see a bear charging at you and the first time you've ever seen a bear you start to run there's a reflex there uh, that your uh, brain makes it's an automatic response but then you know after, every time you see a bear from then on out you might be uh, like maybe what they call rationally scared of, of bears because your only experience with the bear was that it was charging you now you think, well, that's not very good. I mean, in terms of learning, because you're not learning all the nuances of what a bear is. But 
if you think about it from a survival standpoint, it makes a lot of sense that you would have a response like that. So in, in humans, say, this fear learning or one-shot learning takes or one-shot learning takes the form of fear learning, which is something that you learn to survive, but it doesn't give you a lot of detail. And that's what people are trying to do in re reinforcement learning. Um, and uh, so, you know, people are trying to figure out how to do that. Um, they're not scaring their models to death. Uh, they're just <laughs> they're just trying to find out how to encode that one shot learning. So um, we rely on the fact that bodies of most robots and animals have a discrete graph structure. Nodes of the graph may represent the joints, edges, and represent physical dependencies between them. So this is a, an example of their model. So their model has a, a nervous net that's goes from, you know, all different parts of the body. So you have the root, the torso, left hip, ankle. So they they have this uh, this polyped here with different segments. And they map it to this nervous system, which are a bunch of nodes, which are basically the joints. And then they're connected by these connections. So it's, a it's like a neural net, but it's actually like this sort of, it takes the structure of the organism. And then it processes things locally and maybe globally, but there's no centralized nervous system. It's just all distributed. And so uh, nerve net seems to be naturally suitable for structuring transferring tasks or structure transferring tasks as most of the model weights are shared across the nodes, nodes and edges respectively. So it doesn't have any centralized area. Uh, if you have an input at one place in the model, it doesn't require, you know, um, it to travel very far, can process things locally. That's the advantage of this type of model. And so then they also have, uh, yeah, they have dem a demo and code at this link in the paper. And I think that's still active. And then they talk a little bit more about the nerve net. So they have a walker ostrich model, which is this model, which is a walker is a, like, you know, it's a biped, a bipedal model where the agent walks, you know, puts one foot in front of the other. So this foot goes, it moves over here. This foot moves over here. The head and the arm have to remain stable on top of that. And they model this using this kind of, uh, this kind of arrangement where there's a distributed nervous system across the, the entire organism, the entire morphology. And so this is a really nice paper. I, I didn't know if people had been doing anything on this, but, um, and then they kind of get into the technical details of how to, uh, deal with propagation and inputs and outputs. And then the learning algorithm itself. So to interact with the environment, the agent generates a stochastic policy after several propagation steps. The environment, however, produces a reward for the agent and transits to the next state with a transition probability. And then the target of the agent is to maximize the cumulative return. So it's a maximization process. Uh, the optimize the expected reward, we use the proximal policy optimization by Shulman. And in PPO, they call it PPO. And there's a certain method for that. And then, you know, so if you know anything about reinforcement learning, and we haven't talked about it in this group, reinforcement learning is actually heavily based on uh, what they call behaviorism in, in psychology. And behaviorism is basically where you give the organism a reward. You, you have it interact with the environment. You give it a reward, and there's a feedback to the organism. It tells the organism that that choice is rewarding in some way. So if you think about the classic, like, radio arm maze where they put a mouse into a maze that has a bunch of arms and they put cheese in one of the arms and the mouse has to find the cheese. And then you keep putting it in, in the same arm or in different arms and the mouse can learn like which arm has the cheese and which arm does not have the cheese. And it'll optimize its spatial behaviors in that way. Um, now behaviorism fell out of fashion in psychology uh, around the time of the cognitive revolution. But the one of the people who one of the sort of the grandfathers of reinforcement learning actually was he did his PhD in behavioral psychology. So it's like there's a very strong connection with the two fields. 
And so I did a lecture in Nevilleworm ML on reinforcement learning. So if you want to look that up, that's a good place to start. But there are a lot of other resources out there. Um, anyways, this is a, it's a good paper. You should read through it more carefully uh, if you're interested. And that's in the folder as well. The third paper is, uh, okay, so this is a long paper, and I'm not going to go through it too much, but this is a paper on models of communication and control for brain networks. So this is a huge review on uh, brain networks, and by brain networks, they mean like um, you, like it, these, these groups I know for a fact that they take human brains and they do like neuroimaging of the brain, and then they take, uh, you know, uh, they take a unit of analysis, like it could be a voxel of data, which they use in imaging, or it could be a brain area or a brain region, and they use it as a node. And then the and the edges are actually the connections between those nodes. So they could be the activity that's shared between two brain regions or the activity shared between two voxels. And they establish that as a link, and then they build networks from that. So the idea is you can build these brain networks, even from the human brain, but you can do it, of course, in animals, and build these connection patterns. And they call that, uh, you know, that's not like uh, direct connectivity, but they call effective connectivity, or like you're inferring connection from like how different parts of the brain co-respond to stimuli. And so they uh, talk about this, they do a huge review on this, in terms of methods of communication and control for understanding these networks. So um, they use network control theory as a framework, and they say they're applying this to these brain networks. So they, they derive these brain networks from data, and then they have to figure out like what's going on over time, because you get a network, you can get a single network for a single snapshot in time, and you can get net, different network topologies for different snapshots in time, but how do you bring those all together into sort of a dynamic model? And that's really what they're trying to get at here. So they use network control theory as a model for that. They also use signal processing as a, a way to like kind of uncover more information in these networks. And then in this review, they compare two theoretical approaches in the context of brain networks along the lines of level of abstraction and the nature and complexity of the models and the dependence of communication and control measures on these network attributes. So, and then they also deal with uh, spatiotemporal scales. So there's a lot of stuff in the review on different aspects of this. Um, let's see if they have any good figures in here. Here's a good figure. <coughs> so this isn't like last week we talked about the uh, free energy principle. That's not what this is, but it's it's a very similar idea. And that is that you have, you, what you do in these networks is you're measuring your brain at different times. So this is t equals zero, this is some initial state, and then you go around, you know, you're measuring the brain at different times. Say you present a stimulus, like we do to the Breitenberg vehicles, and that stimulus is there and the organism is interacting with it, it's seeing it, may see other stimuli, it might move towards it, or it might just kind of try to reach for it, or something like that. And so, in all that behavior, the brain network changes its topology or its connectivity. Um, even sometimes if you're just staring at a stimulus, it can change. And so, this it can be put on this sort of energy landscape, where you're using a control model to optimize the, or trying to figure out how the activity changes through an optimization scheme. So you assume that, for example, the brain is optimizing its activity over time, where you're trying to figure out where it is on this energy landscape. And so you have to apply a control model, sort of, you have to apply a communication model to understand the time evolution and a control model to understand sort of the reverse problem. So that, that's the way they've kind of conceptualized it. Again, I'm not doing it a lot of justice because, you know, I don't want to get very deeply into it. But, uh, I mean, they lay it out in the paper here. You have, you know, you can go from a topological model of a network, which is this connectivity model, 
to you know a information theoretic model, which is just finding statistical correlations in different nodes over time. So these dots represent nodes; they represent brain regions. And one way to do it is to look at like their common activity and and you know draw a line between them and saying those two things are connected. Another way to look at it is to look at the correlation over the time series. So the times over time these areas have a certain value in terms of information. Are they correlated or are they anti-correlated? And that can give you information about how these behave over time. And then dynamical models can also be used, which are kind of in between these two. And uh, they go through that quite a bit. Um, I, I don't know if I'd recommend this for a beginner, but of course it's a review, so it's written in a way that's somewhat accessible to people. Uh, maybe you have to be like a uh, neuroimaging person to understand all of it, but it might be of interest. <clears throat> so then this, uh, I'm going to go through five papers. I'll go through the next two. This one's um, kind of a shorter one. This is Evolutionary Games with Environmental Feedbacks. And I thought this was interesting just because of the title. Um, so this looks, this actually looks at something called evolutionary games, which is game theory, sort of using an evolutionary approach to approach game theory, and then using environmental feedbacks, uh, in a way to, you know, to make those games a little bit more realistic. So they go through this, uh, they talk about eco-evolutionary games. This doesn't have any figures in it, but it has, oh, here's, here's a figure. So they look at like evolutionary games. And evolutionary games are, you know, game theory, which is a, a way to measure interactions between agents and give them, you know, strategies and payoffs. And then evolutionary game theory really deals with the evolution of these strategies over time. So you get uh, feedback from, you know, if, if I choose a strategy and you choose a strategy, I get feedback on that and I try to improve upon that strategy and then you try to improve upon that strategy and there's an evolutionary process that you can model that with and eventually we either end up winning someone ends up winning where there's an equilibrium between us where everyone you know maybe both of us are better off or neither of us neither of us are better off or whatever and so that's what evolutionary game theory is concerned with is modeling those interactions over time and so they look at uh, environmental feedback as a way to sort of uh, optimize those interactions a bit. And they use the Gold Rush game as an example. So, you know, they have a sort of a payoff matrix here where they say there's an incentive to follow the Gold Rush, incentive to lead the Gold Rush, incentive to follow the environmental movement, incentive to lead the environmental movement. So in this case, it's like you're choosing to either, you know, you go to like a forest on the frontier, you know, and there's gold, and you either choose to mine gold or preserve the environment, and you can either be a follower or a leader in that. And that's what this this payoff matrix is about. And so it just models all these interactions. Um, and then it looks at, but importantly, it looks at the evolution of these, like these incentives and the payoffs, and then also the strategies that the players follow. So if you you know if you're into game theory, this is a good paper to read. Um, if you want to know more about game theory, I think I also did a a game theory lecture in the Devorm ML session, or you can you know learn about it from books and things like that. And so one of the things they have in evolutionary games are these nice graphs, where they, they they're called phase portraits, and they basically describe different phases of the system. So like you have two parameters on your graph it's a bivariate graph and you're depending on your values of your variables you fall into one or more regimes so in this case for this in this relationship the entire thing is by stability so for any parameter value you have for these two variables the result is by stable but in this graph in this relationship it's a little bit different this is where you have a regime that's low impact, a regime that's bistable, and then this open regime here. And you have the 
it's kind of sort of an opposite thing here where you have high impact strategies for these values, by stability for these values, and these are cycles, I guess. And then for this, it's a mixed equilibrium, and then different types of cycles up here. So that's the way you analyze this type of evolutionary games with graphs like that. Um, then you could also, this is, uh, if you're interested in dynamical systems, people are doing things like this, and analyzing dynamical systems in terms of evolutionary game theory. You know, they're looking at things like temporal dynamics and then phase portraits, which are these things where you have, like, these clines that represent an attractor point in space. You know, they're very theoretical graphs, but they give an idea about, you know, the system as a whole and the, the relationship to a phase space. And so uh, I'm not going to talk any more about this article. I think you can go through it if you're interested. I just wanted to point that area out. And then finally, this Ullman paper, which is brand new. This is probably of probably the most interest to everyone here. This is using neuroscience to develop artificial intelligence. So there's been a lot of debate about uh, sort of the relationship between neuroscience and artificial intelligence. And, and I think we've talked about that in the meeting. Um, that, you know, they're not, of course, the same thing. That artificial intelligence, sometimes, you know, we think of deep learning as doing things that the brain does. But, of course, the brain does things a lot differently. And so you're generating some intelligence using AI. But is it really something that the brain would come up with? Or what's the relationship? And so in this, in this article, they basically talk about combining deep learning with brain-like innate structures may guide network models towards human-like learning. That's the sort of the payoff of this paper. And uh, so when the mathematician Alan Turing proposed the question, can machines think, in the first line of a seminal 1950 paper that ushered in the quest for artificial intelligence, the only known system is carrying out complex computations for biological nervous systems. And so I guess, yeah, so that basically points out that like before Turing, you know, you really didn't have anything resembling artificial intelligence, but now we do. I don't know if I would say, well, I think biological nervous systems is a good limit on that. But some people would argue maybe biological systems in general. But um, And so they kind of weigh out the case for, you know, they kind of talk about this debate a little bit. And the differences between like deep learning and biological brains, and then they go go into um, okay. Here's a good figure. Uh, this is a difference between uh, what he calls an informed AI network, which is a multi-layered neural network, and a complex nervous system. So this is a, a cortical network. So this is in the uh, neocortex of mammals, where you have these uh, cells that you have a lot of connections here, a lot of synapses and, ac and axons uh, branching up from central cells. So you can see that unlike this case where you have distinct connections between cells and they're very neat, in the, in the real brain you have just this tangled mass of connections and axons that, or and synapses that branch out and many different directions from a single axon, something you don't really see in this model here. Furthermore, it's layered, not just like, you know, they're, they're like layers that go sort of vertically, but you also have horizontal communication. And so in the artificial neural network, you only have this one-way communication with maybe some feedback. But in the real brain, you have a lot of different potential means of, of communication. So... You can have feedbacks, you can have, you know, connections to many different cells at once, but those connections are graded because you have a lot of synapses connecting to a single cell and their activation rules. So, and that gets into more what Z is laying out in the paper in terms of heavy learning. But these are, you know, this is the norm for biological neural networks. And so uh, this... This paper kind of lays out the differences between the two, 
and sort of talking about like how we can improve our deep learning models. Um, so if the success of current deep network models in producing human-like cognitive abilities proves to be limited, a natural place to look for guidance is again neuroscience. So he's making the point, he's making the argument that we need to look back to neuroscience for more inspiration for this. And so combining the empirical and computational approaches to the problem is likely to benefit in the long run both neuroscience and AGI, which is our artificial general intelligence, and could eventually be a component of a theory of intelligence processing that would be applicable to both. And so that that's maybe a good paper to read if you're interested in this debate, but also in general, in terms of how to think about artificial networks versus uh, biological networks. So are there any questions on that or any comments? Okay. Well, I left the link in the chat if you want to check those papers out. You're welcome to do so. And then maybe we can talk about maybe someone wants to present one of them or talk about it some more in a later meeting, that would be good too. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the, I want to get, I'm going to get to the manuscript, but I wanted to first say that he submitted the, uh, the, the abstract for the Twitter conference this week, and I mentioned it in the weekly email. So congratulations uh, to everyone on that. Um, it's, they're, it's going to I don't know when they're going to make their decision. I think it'll be accepted, I'm pretty sure. Um, but it's uh, it's out it's uh, on, in their hands. And so the next step on that would be to get the slides together and we'll do that in the next two weeks because the presentation is on March 20th. So we have a little bit of time to work on that. But like I said last meeting, we sort of have our assignments on that. I believe they extended the abstract for that. If for, uh, not for us, obviously, it doesn't matter. But, um, uh, was it, do you know if it was like the 28th or something? Yeah, they, they usually, on these conferences, they usually extend the abstract yeah. about a week. It always happens. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the paper, Stefan, the papers are in this repository here. Um. Uh, oh, right. in the chat. Uh, yeah. okay. and it should be shareable. No, so, if, so the link is there, like the one that you've yeah. just sent. Yeah, just click yeah, on it's, the link. It's, it's fine. Maybe you can send, send the link, the link in, in email after the meeting because I'm currently accessing the meeting from my smartphone and I can uh, neither I open the link or can I copy it over. That's well, I can send it in an email if you need, but um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. That would be awesome. Right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so it always happens that they extend the deadline by about a week. I don't want to tell people that in advance because people will just blow it off, but it always, yeah. you know, people always run out of time, so it's always like a thing. Um, you shouldn't rely on that, by the way. You should just kind of operate on that deadline, and then if they extend it, then it's because <laughs> they might not extend it. You never know. I kind of wanted the neuroethics group that I'm volunteering, helping out with, or whatever, to contribute something, but I don't think it will work even with that extension. So oh, yeah. it's okay. Yeah, and then um, so then we'll get our time, and then we'll have it uh, again in subsequent meetings. We'll talk about you know what we need precisely. We'll you know. Uh, like if you're doing an instantiation like Z or Stefan or Ankit, you know, think right now about like how you might lay that out. And then maybe next week we can like see, you know, just maybe bring a draft or like an idea of how that would work and then we can discuss it. And I have, actually, actually, I have a, I have a question, question about that. that. Um, thinking, thinking about, about things just now. So, so we, we have, have, do we have like a set number of slides we can use or like, like tweets? I mean, yeah, I think five is the limit. Five or six. So, so five, five tweets, tweets and, and do we have, when I think of a tweet, I think there are links and there are pictures. Is there 
like if, if you, you have, have one tweet, the maximum number, number of pictures you can put on it is four, right? right? Is, is is there a sense, a sense of using, using all four, four pictures, pictures or just one, or is there? Well, I think any? maybe the most effective way to do it would be to have like one image, which is like a, you know, think about it as like an infographic or a figure in a paper, yeah. where you put out your idea graphically. You don't put too many words in it, but you put in the idea, and then will attach it one image because you know it's it, people want to read it within like about two minutes so they want to get it you know absorb it before they get to the next one and then like you know we'll give them like uh, some text on the top and you can put links in the text in the tweet you know in the body mm -hmm. of the tweet but then you can attach a, an image and i would only attach one because it's you know uh what it's going to be like five over fifth maybe I think it's 15 minutes, 10 minutes. So they have about two minutes or three minutes to absorb that information. So you don't want to give them too much stuff at once. Because then they'll okay. go through it. And then, so it's like, you know, just presentation-wise, I think it's cleaner just to do one image. So one, one high-quality high image, image per the tweets. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then that, that'll work. Um, yeah. Okay. We're asking about making presentation like shared slides so that we can add our parts oh yeah i'll set up the shared slide or the we can uh well i can yeah I, let me share a slide deck with you I'll, I'll create one and then we can put them in there and i'll send it out yeah. like after the meeting yeah i think that's probably good okay. because then you have like a then we'll have like one place yeah, like, like, like we, we must have an outline, outline and then we'll fill in just like, like we did in our paper, paper. Yeah, we can do that. I have the outline somewhere. It's in my notes from last time, I think. So we'll do that. Z, did, were you going to say something? Okay. Um, so I guess Jesse's question okay. brings me to the next thing, which is the, and this is just, we're going to, him and I, are, we're going to talk about this for a couple of minutes. Uh, the CI abstract. So this is the collective intelligence abstract. So I'm working on it a little bit this week and getting it down like three pages and we'll keep working on it. The deadline for that is the first. So it's in a week or so, maybe a week and a half. Mm. But one thing they request is a graphical abstract. And so this is the thing you were talking about with the Twitter conference is that uh, you know, how do you make this effective? And so I have a folder here. It should be shareable and graphical. Oh. Yeah, that was in the, f that was in that folder. Okay, I was wondering what, I was wondering what the graphical abstract subfolder was in there. Yeah. Okay. So let me put this link in the chat here. So this is for the graphical abstracts of the papers. And this folder actually has some interesting sort of guidelines to the graphical abstract concept. So when you say graphical abstract, it's kind of hard to figure out what they mean. You know, it's like obviously it's like making an image, abstract as an image, but there's a sort of a guide to it. So this is the cell press graphical abstract guidelines here. And it, it's very like, you know, uh, there are a lot of, Deta there's a lot of detail in this, um, but it just gives you sort of the outline of it if you're interested. Um, you know, and like in this case, and, and I think in a lot of cases, it's about combining figures that you have. So in this case, there are some figures that we need that are mentioned in the paper that would be in the abstract. But there, it's got to be organized in a certain way, I guess, to make it effective in terms of communication. So uh, this is an example they give. They take these three figures and they make them into, condense them into a split panel. Then they remove the sort of the technical detail of the figure. And then they remove a lot of the extra text that was, you know, kind of describing what was going on in it. So you end up with this sort of almost like a cartoon of a process. And, you know, I mean, there's some figures that we need to put in this, but 
then we have to figure out how to organize it onto this sort of graphical abstract. And that's that would be the this sort of the 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 debate <laughs> on how that was would be structured. But that's so that's a description of the graphical abstract concept or the sort of guidelines for doing it. Here's an example of one where you have uh, you know this concept you have this process going on this chemical process for these uh, bacteria so bacteria iron metabolism and it just shows like the effects and summarized over on the right so that's a very neat presentation and then the comic style so this is a comic this is a little bit uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend this, but this is one way to do it too, is where you can draw a comic and it just gives an idea of what's going on in the paper. So you have this evil bacteria apparently stroking a cat in a chair, and then they're trying to plot domination of the nerve or of the immune system, and then they found a treatment for it, so he's now on this table uh, being injected with this uh, antiviral and then uh, whatever and then we have someone saying that this is a great thing to be a new weapon against superbugs so it kind of describes the finding <laughs> that way <laughs> I like the white suit and red beak yeah <laughs> and that's then good, yeah. yeah that's a good way to <laughs> and then this final one again is it's very uh, entertaining you have this pill knocking out this bacteria uh, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, they try to make it fun, but you don't have to make it fun. You just need to make it effective in terms of how people are, you know, in terms of people getting the idea across to people. I think in this case, it would be just a matter of putting in figures, but also being sort of very, very, um, you know, making it easy for people to understand what's going on. Is that part of the three-page three abstract, abstract or just a separate abstract, abstract well, I think you, I think they want a graphical abstract and then the three-page. I, I don't okay. know. Maybe that's the way they want it, but I'll have to look at the details, but a graphical abstract would be good either way if you know, okay. you advertise I'll, it. I have thoughts about that. I'll yeah. Check that out. I'll have to put together some, like, uh, image, some base images for it, but then we can work on it a little bit. Or this week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then, yeah, the, so the CI 2020 abstract, we'll uh, work on that some more, and we can work on that later. Uh, and then finally, getting to the manuscript, I wanted to get to this again. Uh, I think we're in pretty good shape on this. Uh, I got some thank you from Z Stefan for making some changes on his methods. Um, I also got the changes from NKIT, or we, we did some stuff with, I think we mentioned that last week. Um, let me check how many words are there in this now. Um, so we're getting close to the time when we'd like to submit this. We had an internal deadline in March 1st. Mm -hmm. So that should that's coming up pretty soon. So I think we're in pretty good shape for it, though. This is slowing down here. Okay, a little over ten thousand words. This means fine. It's just that uh, just wanted to see where we were on that. So again, we have the title, the abstract, uh, the introduction. I think it's pretty clean. Now we have uh, the introduction here we have several sections and then we get down to the embodied cognition i think jesse and i have like finished up on that i think that looks good um and the numbering was fixed so i've got the numbering in place and we had a couple of people mm -hmm. contributing re references so we've got those all in place now uh feedback feedback egrt i think that's been taken care of in the Oh, wait a minute. Summary comment. So actually, maybe a summary comment. So you can get back to the comments using this comment history. So if you accept it, it's 
Okay. Okay, the summary comment at EGRT mega representation and movement towards regulatory mechanisms. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, put that in as a maybe as a separate comment here. Well, actually, maybe I'm going to put it here so I can. It might be better down below, but. Um, I'll just put it as a new comment for now. And I'll think about it before, you know. And then the methods. So then this is the method here that's, uh, I know that I saw that uh, Stefan had changed some things in the method descriptions. So that was, I incorporated those, made sure those were consistent. Um, and then Z stuff was incorporated, of course. Talked about that last week. Let me see. Okay, I think it's all formatted well. And then we have Z's. Uh, or are you going to say something, Stefan? Or? Let's see. Okay, so Z says Mar March 1st is our intended yeah, deadline for some printing a preprint. Yes, that's, the, I, that's our I think deadline. We say something about modifications. Okay. So basically, I uh, mostly explains the equations that I have, as we discussed, so that it's more understandable to the reader. Yeah. And, yeah, just some places, you know, some words. Yeah, it looks, it looks good. Um, All right. Yeah. So I think it's pretty good. Um, That's good. Yeah. And then uh, we have... Uh, Ink it stuff here, and then the results. So this has all been fleshed out. We have the three instantiations. The figure, you know, we can, like, fit the figures in. Well, I mean, I've tried to fit them in as well as I can, but I may have to fit them in a little bit better. It's just a matter of sizing them right and getting the text in the right order, but that's, it. that's easy. Uh, and then mm -hmm. we have the figures here. all come out pretty well and then this is the uh so actually you know i never did put in the mention of the supplemental graphs but i will put that in before like the gif yeah so uh yeah so the supplemental files that you sent me on kid i'll put them i'll mention them here they're not in the text but i will put them in um, and it's just a matter of saying we have supplemental files, which are animations. And then... Um, yeah, so I gave you one, one animation, I would like give you the rest of animations later. Okay. Yeah, if you have more, you can send them the same way that you did before. Yeah. And then we can actually, I can put them in like as a different supplemental figures. So, you know, we can have like these screenshots, but then we can have, you know, a number of supplemental figures that are, you know, part of the part of the submission and then people can look at them and offline. I mean they'll be attached to the paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so then we have that's all there, this table. Then the discussion I think is where we had the open issues, but I think we've solved those. Oh, is that? No. I had something to say in the collective intelligence part when okay. we come. Yeah, coming up on it. So we we had this. We, I think this was all worked out. Uh, feedback, use cases. Okay, so this is the part I think that you were wanted to comment on. Yeah. So you wrote like uh, in this application a set of stimuli are generated using a deep neural network, but this was not the case actually. What what I planned to do was like introduce uh, uh, like many random uh, random set of stimuli of different types and then like uh, they are 
firstly they are trained with uh, different kind of labels which which labels like uh, like what kind of provocation that that stimulus pro, uh, generates and thereafter once we have training uh, and when we like introduce those kind of uh, those kind of stimuli in the environment, the vehicle, it's not actually the vehicle, but we can say that the deep learning uh, model or method is, is being governed by the vehicle. So, so we, we, we just apply deep learning method on uh, deep learning on those stimuli, which is image or text or anything. And then like we get the response from uh, like we get the label on the stimulus. And then as usual, we, we like, um, we use that on the vehicles and to generate this kind of cumulative behavior. So, yeah, I wrote a comment just a bit ago. Okay, right here. This one, uh, I plan to introduce a random combination of stimuli, label them as particular behavior provokers, and then use deep learning to identify those labels. Uh, okay, so then you're saying that it's actually label them as the provokers, like... Like these vehicles, or this stimuli provokes this in the in the vehicles, and then so you would analyze the behavior yeah. of the vehicles with deep learning. Yeah. So, like when we have different kind of stimulus in in the environment, and and they they are already trained, so uh, we know that uh, like when we when they are already trained and we when we introduce them into the environment the vehicle knows that uh, by deep learning the vehicle knows that this uh, stimulus is this kind of uh, provoker so it acts accordingly and when we have like combinations of uh, other like different type of stimulus we will have like uh, very complex behavior so that was the plan yes Okay, thanks for clarifying mm -hmm. that. I wasn't like I guess I was trying to figure out. I mean, you know what? You know, it, it, it's not um, it's subtle, so yeah. But I want to make sure I had it right, of course. Um, yeah. So I I didn't have time, so I, I just saw it uh, just before the meeting and wrote it. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing it out. So I'll I'll, I'll fix that. Um, and then mm, so this will be last. Oh, was that? This is the I just said, the, like, this is the only thing that I need to change, and everything else seems sorted. Okay. I, I read it last week also. Okay, yeah. So then we have the use cases, then the limitations and future issues, and I think that's probably good. And then now we have, I think, 77 mm -hmm. references, which is pretty good. Um, yes, I think we're all set on the paper, except for a couple things that, uh, like, uh, if uh, Inkit wants, you know, if he wants to add in more uh, movies, he's welcome to do so. Uh, just mm -hmm. get them to me. So our deadline is March 1st. So when is that? That is, let me check my calendar. <clears throat> so two weeks from now. Yeah. Like one week. Uh, one week and a couple days. Week. So that March 1st is on a... Sunday. Sunday, yeah. So it's one week and one day from now. So why don't we, yeah, next week, why don't we say uh, we'll just, uh, you know, uh, try to, like, make all the finalizations, you know, make sure everything's in place, and then the next day we'll I'll submit... And then we'll, I'll send you notification when it's up. But we'll just make sure that it's all mm -hmm. like in order. And I mean, it's mostly there. Yeah. You want to make sure everything. So if anyone has anything, like if, if you want to make changes, this is the week to do it because we'll be doing it on the first, which is next Sunday. And so next week we'll finalize that and we'll have some more discussion probably about the CI app strip because that's due on the first as well. So Jesse and I will finalize that. And then maybe if you hear about the Twitter conference, we'll talk about that. So at the end of the hour, um, any other comments or questions? Yeah, I had one uh, question about, I saw that you, I kind of missed 
what you said when you brought up the EGRT mega representation comment on the paper. We kind of like took it from the history and put it back on there. Or was it just like a hey, you know, like, you know, just to kind of look at it again? Or like, were you saying you should really put something like that in there? Or well, I kind of missed. This was from your comment. It was just uh, add EGRT mega representation and yeah. movement towards regulatory mechanisms. I don't know if this is already in the paper or not. Okay. Just, it was, it sounded like something that you, you saw and you didn't want to. You don't oh, want no, me to, no. like, forget it, basically. Okay. Forget it? Okay. No, no, no. I was, I was saying, like, I wasn't sure what, um, like, brought it back up again. Was it just, like, you didn't want the comment to be lost in the... Oh, yeah. I just wanted right? to make sure that it got addressed. But I wasn't sure okay. if we had addressed it. So that's why I put it back okay. in. Okay, that's all. All right. Um, yeah, I'll try to go through, um, like, copy edit stuff this week too um but then that'll probably be it for the paper for me and then getting on the the ci stuff so yeah yeah okay thanks yeah uh so mm -hmm. anyone else have anything else they want to say before we go or any mm -hmm. i was asking if like uh, i saw devans was like uh, uh Formatting his his uh, his paper was maybe formatted in latex. So uh, are we good with uh, Google Drive, or we need to do some what do you mean? Stuff, latex or something like uh, like this uh, Google Drive uh, document is is all good to submit to some something, or we need to do mo more kind of some formatting or something like that. Oh no, I think this is uh, the, the formatting is good for now. There might be some small format. I'll take care of the formatting, but. I think Devanch actually, uh, mm -hmm. the, his paper was uh, camera ready to a conference. So that's why it looked like that. Yeah. Yeah. The conference was, the conference was submitting you need to put the content in that template. Is it a lot of work, just uh, like a few hours of work, it makes a day? Yeah, they require cool. a certain template for that conference. So that's like what they call the two column format. And so sometimes they require that, but. I don't like that format for general purposes. So, but anyways, um, and then Z. Actively, conferences like follow back the same format, so it's uh, the file is given you to put all the content. There's no other way. Like they don't accept uh, such submissions. So it, it would be given on the conference page if that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, there's no such rule in general, generally, but I'm not sure. It depends on where you're submitting. Yeah. Uh, Z had a question about the. So, which abstract are you asking about? The the Twitter conference abstract or the CI abstract? Okay. No, I was asking about the paper. Oh yeah. All right. So this this is for Z. This uh, link here. This is the CI abstract. And I can send it out in an email afterwards. Um, all right. There you go. All right. So uh, well, it's the top of the hour. Thanks for attending today. And uh, talk to you guys next week. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye. Talk to you later.